So this data, uh, once it came as the RTI, uh, we analyzed it and we published it in during the pandemic. And uh, before we made the data public, we had communicated with the administration to uh, see the data and do something about it. But they didn't, they completely ignored the data and didn't uh, do anything on this particular thing. Finally, we published this data in our social media handles and it was fine. They are taken by the newspapers and it was published by almost all major newspapers in 2020. So this is the first, uh, the overall department-wise uh, data on, so we collected data for the last, for five years, from 2015 to 2019. And uh, so the data shows that no department in IIT Bombay implemented reservation properly in like, like in any of the categories. Uh, and uh, so if you, so this itself was like, of course, it was a very really, um, like shocking data. Uh, what was even more shocking or like what was different from our data that was not present in the previous data uh, for which IIT always, whenever you raise the question of why are there not enough candidates uh, from ACSU OBC background, IIT always use the excuse that we don't get enough applicants. So our data completely like disproves that. So we collected the data on how many people were applied, how many uh, were called for interview, like how many were called for the written exam, how many uh, cleared the written exam and reached the interview, and finally how many were selected. So we had the consolidated data. So out from which we created this uh, result, which shows that 11 departments in IIT Bombay in the last in the five years from 2015 to 2019. Not a single ST student was admitted. So this was the most shocking data. Like even though there were enough candidates to apply. Uh, so we computed like if reservation was properly implemented, how many students they should have actually taken it. And the five years, 168 seats for ST, ST, uh, for ST students was left vacant. Or that seat was filled by general candidates. So the mandated reservation now uh, is that at least 7.5% of the seats should be filled by states, but only like 1.64% uh, was filled. So this despite having more than 1500 applicants. So uh, this is for data for the SC student and so when you move like to SC students, two departments again like did not uh, admit any SC students. And uh, three departments just admitted one SE student in the five years. And as you can see, the number of applicants is like more than 100 in most of these departments. And uh, like 12 departments did not admit, like they admitted less than five SE students in five years. That means like not even one student per year. So again, like when we calculated like how many students miss, were denied their seats, it's like 215 seats were denied. And there are more than uh, close to 9,000 applicants. So only half the mandated seat were actually filled. The data is much more worse when it comes to OBC when you compare like how many applicants actually were selected. It's like more, almost 18,000 students applied and still they couldn't fill like this 23 uh, seats. And still there were departments which did, so the uh, minimum mandate is like 27% and there is a department which couldn't fill a single candidate from OBC despite having applicants. So 10 departments, so 27 is the minimum and there are 10 departments which didn't even fit like 15%. Uh, so uh, this was consulted data for like uh, 5 years. Yes. So when you, for PhD admissions and when we go to each individual year and look at whether reservation was implemented like every year, this shows the actual uh, status. So, in on average, 20 departments does not admit an SC student in any year, and like almost like on average, 10 departments will not admit an SC student, and seven to five five to seven departments will not admit. So, the proportion of students who are coming will never even reach close to the minimum mandate of reservation. And uh, what is very interesting is. When you look at 2020, when AWS reservation uh, became active, uh, IIT doesn't have any issue with implementing or over-implementing AWS reservation. 
then we see that like in 2020, uh, when AWS subscription mandate is like 10%, they took 24% uh, of fields by AWS reservation, which is actually more than like SCST OBC intake combined. So uh, now, once we had this data of like PhD admission, uh, and we clearly saw that IITs are not recruiting enough candidates. Uh, we started looking at what, what are the reasons, like why, why is this happening and why is it not being questioned. So when we uh, published this data, we had communicated to the administration, to the faculties and everyone and other than what happened in the public sphere, like in the news and stuff, nothing happened inside IIT. There was no uh, motivation to do anything about this particular data even after our repeatedly raising this issue. So we filed the next level of RPIs to understand what is the demography or the composition of faculties. This is the faculty data. So as you can see, like how the faculties are, like faculty data is like completely skewed towards like upper class in some sense. Like, so in the last, like we got started data from 2007 onwards, like, uh, and we found like how many are actually being recruited from these categories. And in most of the years, there is no recruitment from SCST or OBC. And the result is worse for STs, like there is not a single faculty who has been recruited uh, in the years like 2007 to 2009, 2020. And uh, not a single associate professor was recruited from ST category. And for, in OBCs, there was not a single um, associate in 14 years. So just like the last time, like because we had read again and again that there is no enough qualified applicants and stuff, we find how many applicants are actually there. So this is the application data. It is not that there was an application, the lack of applicants. There was always applicants, much more than the like actual fees, which should have actually gone to these candidates, but they are not deliberately filling it. So um, after like we raised this issue in the national media and like a lot of other groups were also working parallel to bring out this data, it put some pressure on the government to implement the mission mode recruitment to fill the uh, vacancies, like which are allotted for SCST, OBC faculties and implement the solution properly in it. So the interesting thing is uh, in 2019, uh, I think the government uh, had pa uh, passed this um, implementation of reservation, like Teachers Care Act, in 2019 it was passed, which actually includes or uh, brings into the ambit of reservation all the technical recruitments in IITs at all levels. And uh, the government asked the IITs to form a committee uh, which will actually implement reservation or recommendations to how to properly implement reservation in the faculty recruitment in IITs. Uh, the committee was chaired by the then director of IIT Delhi, uh, Professor Ram Gopal Rao, and uh, the, the committee finally, when it came with a report, there were two things in the report which was like very striking. First thing, in the report they very constantly said that IIT is implementing reservation in PhD admissions. Like they clearly lied in the report, telling that they are already fulfilling the reservation criteria. And the uh, second thing that they told is they went outside their ambit uh, to, so they, they were asked to suggest ways to improve the implement reservation. They came up with the recommendation that IAT should be exempted from the reservation. So there was a lot of backlash from the report. Uh, and finally, the government had set aside that report and the government in uh, so, I don't know how many of you have heard about the SEMA SIM issue of IIT Kharagpur. So, on an online class uh, in IIT Kharagpur, uh, the professor of IIT Kharagpur uh, was teaching English for uh, preparatory course students, which was uh, basically ACST students, uh, was like openly abusing them on record, on video. It was the first or like a clear documented evidence of uh, caste harassment that was uh, if, like just evident clearly like what was happening in that. And in that she clearly knew who she was addressing because she like dared them to go to the commissions 
again to take action against her in that video. So once that came, there was a huge uh, outcry, and as as a result of like this data coming and all the outcry, the government was uh, pressurized, or the government actually implemented like uh, directed the ministry to implement mission mode recruitment, like fill the vacant positions uh, of SCST OBCs uh, faculty in IITs with immediate effect. Like they said, in one year they should do this mission mode or special recruitment drive and fill the vacancies. So now, uh, when you look at the faculty data of IIT, you can see like how it is skewed. Like if there is 300 general candidates, then there should be uh, 300 SCST OBC candidates. And so, what IIT Bombay did, they didn't open the entire vacancies for in the MMR. They just opened a small number. Like they opened like 77 seats in total. Uh, so that was fine. So for the 77 seats, in our RTA we got how many applied for it. So more than 2,000 people applied. And interestingly, uh, in a recent <coughs> question in Rajya Sabha, uh, the same data was asked in Rajya Sabha, and the ministry actually responded with number of eligible applicants. Like what are, who are the eligible applicants from this particular category? And that is also like okay, almost 2,000. But even though they were eligible, they are not shortlisted. And even if they are shortlisted, they are not selected. So even though they opened 77 seats, which was anyway less than the mandated one, or the vacancy which are actually present, they didn't even feel that. So this is just the data of IIT Bombay. The same thing happened across IITs and IIMs. So why is this happening? Like why is IIT Bombay so reluctant to take students like from or recruit faculty from SCST OBC background? So uh, with respect to the, the the central thing about this uh, particular issue is the idea of merit and how merit is being weaponized to exclude the, the students and uh, the candidates from marginalized backgrounds to actually come into a space like IIT. It's actually kind of threatens the monopoly of those who are already like captured the most of the situation. And uh, recently in uh, JNU, uh, what happened like the, they started releasing the Viva marks. The, along with the return exam marks, they started releasing the Viva marks for these candidates uh, as a mail to every applicant. And from there, it became evident that there is a clear bias against candidates belonging to SCC OBC, in which even though they have the same return exam marks in the in the viva or the interview, like out of 30 marks, the SCC OBC candidates will get single digit marks. So the general category candidates is getting like 28, 29 marks, and this kind of ensures two things: either they are completely out of the game altogether, or even if they qualify. They will always be recruited under the SCST OBC category. They will never actually enter through the general category. So, with respect to IITs, the issue is whenever we raise it as a bias in their admission process, they tell that no, 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 we are unbiased, like our admission process is full close. But they, what they don't ever do is they never make the admission process transparent. Like, no candidate will know how many marks they actually scored in the return. Here, like every department has their own admission procedure. There is no like okay, one depart every department is like 70 marks or 30 marks or by one. It's like every department has their own process. In some department, it is like whatever marks you have been written, in the interview is like a pass fail test. Uh, yeah, so uh, a candidate for applies to IIT only gets a mail if he gets admitted telling that okay you are admitted. There is no other communication from the institute on how, like why. So uh, regarding mission mode, uh, when we talk to the candidates who applied for technical position, their experiences are like they were not given enough time for the interview. So a normal interview for a technical they will give like one hour for presentation. Some candidates here were not even given 10 minutes to present like their PhD and postdoc work. Some candidates didn't who applied, they were not shortlisted. They just got a mail telling that, uh, sorry, you are not shortlisted. Why you are not shortlisted has never been mentioned. 
So the process is opaque and completely arbitrary. And the other thing is, with regard to other kind of observation like supernumerary seeds or EWS, IIT is like very motivated and active to implement it very quickly and very proactively. So there was a document that was written by IIT Delhi, which actually says like why there should be more representation of women. It's a very brilliant document. Like it clearly argues what are the social realities uh, which the, this woman has to face uh, or the barriers that woman has to face in reaching identity and how having better diversity with respect to gender is actually helping the identities. The strange thing is the same logic when we use for caste observation, they, they are like, no, 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 merit is across time. You cannot uh, attack, like, the, you cannot attack merit or merit is something that has to be like sacred, uh, it cannot be questioned. Another thing is like, uh, that, that, that nobody actually questions is, Postdocs as a category is completely outside observation. And in the RPI, when we questioned it, uh, IIT Bombay said that there is no like government rule which actually tells that uh, postdocs should be outside observation. Still, they are not following it. The same with like Monash, which is again, there is no observation in Monash. There is no observation in TAP students. Uh, so, yeah, uh, so I am stopping it and off. Like, uh, I will continue in the next round. Uh, so all our data can be accessed in our website. So uh, thank you, Pratik. Maybe you don't even address more during the Q&A session. And now we have Dr. Uh, Nidhi Dhamma, uh, postdoctoral fellow, Department of yeah. Humanities and Social Sciences. <laughs> so much uh, Pranav, for that uh, uh, expository presentation. Um, as uh, uh, the chair already mentioned, I'm Nitin Donald, uh, postdoctoral fellow with HSS. And uh, uh, today, I will try to highlight a few uh, you know, key features of reservation as a policy, especially uh, from a pre-independence uh, context. Uh, often people think that reservation is something that started after uh, independence, but we have a very long and dynamic history of reservation as a policy, and I will try to capture its essence, uh, you know, to the I need to give the time limit uh, as possible today. Uh, but how do I begin such a task, and what can be a possible starting point? Perhaps uh, Pranav's presentation, um, you know, his presentation, uh, I mean, APPSE's presentation of organizations collectively uh, working with other organizations uh, to systematically bring out numbers, uh, which are then tied, you know, quite confidently to constitutional ideas of justice, equality, and fraternity to a relatively powerful audience. I mean, such uh, acts of exposition uh, have always played a critical role in the institutionalization of reservation. So you will always find that there have been social movements uh, which have preceded uh, the implementation of reservation and this is something that I want to uh, draw attention to. So what uh, Pranav did, uh, or what APPSC is doing, it has many historical antecedents. So it is not something, you know, that, uh, you know, one needs to understand it historically. So let it be Mahatma Jyotiba Fule's representation to the Hunter Commission, or let it be B.R. Ambedkar's representation to the Simon Commission, or Dr. Palpu's representation to the Travel Food Ruler. I will come back to Dr. Palpu in a while. Or the non brahmin Manifesto of Madras. Or the Praja Mitra Mandal's Memorandum to the Maharaja of Mysore. Or Sabodhan Ayyappan's excellent intervention in the Cochin Legislative Assembly. We find numerous instances of historically marginalized groups and sometimes even prominent non brahmin upper castes especially in the peninsular region of the subcontinent and also in Bihar, exposing 
the non-representative or the non-public nature of public employment and education. So this is not happening for the first time. Now why did they insist that public employment ought to be representative? And how did they link the question of representation to education, especially higher education, are some of the questions that I will try and answer with the help of two examples. So Dr. Palku was an important anti-caste intellectual in Kerala in the late 19th century. And as the name suggests, he was a medical doctor. Now a medical doctor in the late 19th century, one would think will, you know, you know, it will be very easy for him to find a job. But that wasn't really the case. And also he wasn't simply a doctor. You know, he was one of the pioneering public health professionals of South Asia. He retired as the chief medical officer of Mysore State. He was at one point the only Asian member in the British Medical Council for Biology, so on and so forth. He was even offered the Divanship of Baroda. Yet Palku had to leave Travancore, which was then a princely state, to become a doctor as Iravas, the caste to which he belonged, were actively discouraged from entering the Trivandrum Medical College. Iravas are today listed under OBCs. So he went to Madras and later London to complete his medical education. And when he was back, he applied for a doctor's job with the Travancore Medical Services. <coughs> the response he received is of great value to this gathering. The state said, that an Idava cannot be appointed as a doctor as there was no precedence and such an appointment would go against the moral and cultural values of the society. He was offered a much lower position. Dr. Palpu had to then migrate to Mysore for a medical career. Something similar happened to K.R. Narayanan, one of the most revered presidents of India. It was customary to absorb the university rank holder as a faculty in Kerala University. However, when K.R. Narayanan became the gold medalist in MA English Literature, he belongs to the Parava caste, which is a scheduled caste, in the 1940s, the state was puzzled, they didn't know what to do, and denied Narayanan the faculty post. He later migrated to Delhi, worked as a journalist, studied further, and the rest is the history. One surely will find similar instances elsewhere. This is not something, you know, peculiar to a tribal guru or Kerala. Now, what is common in these experiences? What does it say about the state, the university or other institutions? One, in the late 19th and early 20th century, we find a measured opening up of education to historically relegated groups. This was achieved as a consequence of social movements and its many political and systematic expositions, as well as a larger global consensus that mass primary education had a positive correlation with economic progress. Thus, you will find schools, scholarships, and fellowships being set up in many parts of the subcontinent, especially in the peninsular region. We also find upper class mobilizing actively against such mass primary education or you know, they had problems with the content that is taught to the lower class Indian women. For example, the letter written by the Dhanga Maharaj, he collected 11,000 signatures and basically argued that, you know, if we were to send all the children to schools, who will look after our farms? So, and all the burning down of schools that we see in many places uh, uh, during the, during the colonial period. However, neither the British nor the ruling elites in princely states were convinced about opening the portals of higher education to the lower class. For example, Dr. P. R. Ambedkar, using the minutes and reports of the British officials, points out how the Brahmins were the most preferred class for the British in matters of modern education and appointment in services, along with other tribal castes. In the same representation to the Simon Commission, Ambedkar highlights how the British felt that uh, creating a class of educated lower caste would lead to widespread social discontent. And the British were right. In Dr. Palku and K. R. Narayanan or B. R. Ambedkar, we find educated men and women 
who were discontent and unready to accept the logic of social institutions. Two, the experiences that, the stories that I narrated, show the cognitive inability of the state and its men to imagine an Irava doctor or a Parava professor, precisely because these are modern positions of power and status. Such inability or rather lack of imagination has been historically visible in anti-reservation discourses and uh, protests. Kumar Chakravarti, K.C. Yadav, Mahesh Dave, etc. have highlighted various aspects of this fact. It is interesting to note that anti-reservation protests were the fiercest when claims of representations were extended to medical, technical, engineering and professional posts. Nobody really cares if the SCs or OBCs are given votes, cows, buffaloes under various caste-based development contributions. Demands for affirmative action, it could be in job, employment or even law, even land, has historically challenged the limits of the ruling elite and they contain within them the possibility of recasting existing institutions. It also expands the role of the state. The state is imagined as a social agent that should intervene on behalf of its people. Now the question is, who benefits when social movements recast our ability to imagine? It would be very it would be a very narrow assessment to think that reservations benefit the reserved categories of individuals. Sunny Kapikar, a leading thinker and anti-caste intellectual of Kerala, highlights that affirmative action of which reservation is a component, redefines the public, makes it more meaningful and thereby affects all of us. Today, we are ready to sit beside each other and didn't even imagine that an Idava can be a doctor. Though some may still argue that certain doctors are more meritorious, we will of course get to that point in a while, but there is a cognitive shift which is an ongoing, quite tenacious project. Now, going back to the non brahmin movements of the late 19th and early 20th century, I'm coming back to the point of merit. One needs to highlight that these movements, when they were asking for greater representation, they were also highlighting the corrupt network of caste-based nepotism in appointments in several provinces, which led to the near total monopoly of the Brahmins and other elite castes in state services. So lack of transparency has been a point for a has been an issue for a long time. Thus, the demand for non brahmin representation often always included demands for the establishment of public service commissions and state selection boards to rationalize bureaucracy through proper entrance exams and roster systems with the aim of ensuring efficiency. As a result of these efforts, the ruling dispensation in princely states and in British India, recognize the need for power diffusion that would ensure the representation of different sections of the society. Access to education, especially higher education, was at the heart of this idea of power diffusion. It is not loss of merit or it is not compromise with merit, but rather efficiency and power diffusion, which actually led to reservation policies in free independence India. And this is the case even today. If you go back to Gail Ombud's article on why reservation, the answer is simple. It is to break the monopoly of the upper caste in services and higher education. And one needs to one needs to um, uh, judge the policy based on what it has achieved or whether it is being possible for the policy to achieve it. Thus, beginning from the rudimentary system of reservation introduced in Mysore in 1874, which was not implemented effectively, one finds similar policies in Shahu Maharaj's Kulhapur in 1902-03, an expanded policy in Mysore based on the Miller Committee report in 1918, the communal order of Madras presidency in 1921, 
reservation for Bombay's backward classes based on the Starte Commission report in the early 1930s, travel food and purchase policy of communal representation in 35-36, and the famous communal award of 1932, granting separate electorates to minorities, including uh, the repressed classes, which was of course met with Gandhi's opposition and transformed into reserved seats. Now, why is power diffusion important? I will just conclude now. I am going back to the Miller Committee report, which was uh, Miller was uh, the Chief Justice of Mysore who was asked to head the committee to uh, make recommendations uh, in favor uh, of the backward classes. And there were a few Brahmin members in the committee too. Uh, the Miller Committee uh, focused on education and it connected education with increase in the status of non brahmins So diffusion of education was perceived as a method to diffuse power. The committee played a crucial role in conceptualizing the idea of backwardness and effective governance through wider participation. Reducing the preponderance of Brahmins in state services was a stated agenda of the committee. The committee stated that the presence, so when the uh, committee presented its uh, report which said that 7 out of 10 seats should be reserved for the non Brahmins, there were dissenting members within the committee who said that this will lead to a loss of merit. Now the committee stated as a response to this dissent, that the presence of a diverse body of civil servants would only help in boosting efficiency and competence as policies and decisions will be informed uh, from beyond the narrow limits of a single caste or community. Thus, reservation was intended to ensure better governance and create structures of greater participation. It was also seen as a nation building exercise. Gay Longwith explains, as I already said, that reservation should be viewed as a mechanism to create monopoly. P.S. Krishnan, a very important bureaucrat who played a crucial role in not just formulating uh, policies on reservation, but he also played a role in formulating the SCST Prevention of Atrocities Act. So P.S. Krishnan also agrees that reservation should be perceived as one among the many programs aimed at expanding our social horizons. So if you go back to the merit argument, uh, P.S. Krishnan has one response to it. Please look at the states which first implemented reservation. They do better in human development than states which did not implement reservation. Thank you.